collages of different kinds of I'm music. I'm a composer. It's like, you know, I'm a composer of electronic music, and I compose political music, and I'm still living. The question is, how? Hey. Welcome to the Q&As of the Norian Film Festival 2021. My name is Christopher and uh, I am organizing the Q&As. Uh, besides the live Q&As, we also have pre-recorded versions and this is a pre-recorded session. And now I'm happy to introduce to you our two guests. We have Martin Stokes uh, as moderation. He's a professor of music and ethnomusicologist at King's College in London. And of course, the director of the film here, B.G. Grani, uh, George Miro. And now I would like to give the word to Martin. Thank you. George Miro's wonderful film, Her B.G. Grani, which means something like Long Live Grani. And Grani uh, is a, a Kurdish dance practice. George Miro's wonderful film is a soundtrack, I suppose you could say, of this dance form, um, of this musical practice, and particularly the sounds of the electro says that support it. What the viewer uh, and, the, and the listener sees and experiences is a series of, of clips, I suppose you could say, of dancing at weddings, interviews with some of the key musicians, demonstrations of the instrument and explanations uh, of what it is that we're hearing and passing clips um, often through the windows, the side windows or the re rear windows of, of cars or taxis uh, or buses of the landscape, the rural landscape and the urban landscape. Musically speaking, it moves very quickly. The, the, the kind of texture and the uh, fidgety nature of the sound makes this film race by. In some ways, it's rather hard to say exactly what the film is about, but it is completely compelling. It is completely wonderful to watch. And one learns a whole lot about an unusual and important kind of, of, of music. So we have a few, uh, a good few minutes uh, with George um, in which we can talk a little bit about the film, uh, talk a little bit about the music and the musicians um, and find out more about it. So to start off with, George, tell us how you first encountered this music and what it was that you found so interesting and compelling about it. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I first sort of came across Kurdish music when I was um, more or less in high school. I, I When I was um, in grade school, I sort of started actively listening to music and I was listening to a lot of rock music, particularly from like the 1960s. And it was, you know, uh, I became interested in the sort of fixation and fascination that a lot of these rock groups had with music from different parts of, especially, I guess, Asia, North Africa. Um, and so I started actively listening to, you know, music from Morocco, Iran, Egypt, India, et cetera, et cetera, and sort of just, you know, sort of delving in more and more into different regions and, you know, always being curious about the regions that I didn't really know that much about. And I think my first exposure to Kurdish music itself was through the recordings made by um, Christian Poche, who was based in uh, Aleppo um, of Kurdish music, mainly f that he recorded in Syria and Lebanon, I believe, um, mainly in Syria. And that was my introduction to, to sort of instrumental music played on the um, tambour or the balama. Um, you know, so there's, you know, this lute that is a sort of a long neck lute that belongs to this immense family of long neck lutes that extends, you know, uh, you know, it's very global in its reach, but there's a particularly, I think, a corridor from sort of um, Central Asia to Eastern Europe, where you have a lot of very closely related uh, long neck lutes, and uh, one of them that is the balama is one that has um, typically three strings, or rather seven strings in arranged in three courses. That is um, exists in, in closely related vari variations in Turkish, Anatolian Turkish, Kurdish, Arab, especially in um, Syria and Lebanon, and Greek iterations, the bazook, the the bazook, the bazooki, you know, et cetera, et cetera, the tambour, the 
Balama and so forth at Chogur. Um, anyway, so that was my first exposure um, to the use of a variation of that instrument uh, for playing very much Kurdish music that is Kurdish in character um, and instrumental sort of improvised music. And that was a recording of uh, Muhammad Ali Tejo and uh, Said Hassan doing a duet. Um, and so that was sort of a basis of uh, growing interest and sort of appreciation for Kurdish music. And then also in 1994, I went to Turkey for the first time, uh, just sort of as a you know tourist backpacker after my freshman year in college. And uh, I remember being on a you know bus going around between the different sites of Cappadocia, and they were listening to the new, new, new newly released Alemji album by Ozil Maz, which had a uh, very uh, featured very prominently Electro Balama played with a phase shifter and a octave uh, octave pedal and so forth, uh, I think by Ozil Maz himself. And I was very struck by the sound of that. Um, it was very, it's very sparse and it was, you know, an interpretation of a what could be thought of as a central Anatolian folk song, but in fact, a song specifically by Nishet Ertash, but that had been reimagined mm -hmm. in this um, sort of drum machine and electro saws accompanied version. Um, and that you know, became something I listened to. I bought that tape and I listened to it quite a bit. And I always thought to myself, what if, you know, there was this acoustic Kurdish music had been, had a sort of electric counterpart. And I was sure that that must exist. And in 2000, um, like in 1997, 99, 2000, I started going to visit different parts of Kurdistan. Uh, particularly I was in 1999, I went to um, Sanandaj and Kerman Shah in, when I was studying in Iran, and I also went to Khorasan and met some Kurdish uh, Dutar players in northeastern Iran. But then in 2000, I went. To, uh, I was studying Arabic in Cairo, and afterwards I went to Syria, and I went and visited um, Muhammad Ali Tejo, the musician who was um, that I've just mentioned that hearing recording of him play, and he's also the the musician whose words are the first sound we hear in, in the film. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I feel safe in including his political commentary because he is unfortunately deceased and also because it's specifically referring to the situation in Syria. He's talking about Aleppo specifically. That's where he lived in this. He was from Afrin and lived in the suburbs of, uh, or not the suburbs, but sort of a Kurdish neighborhood in a sort of out, outlying neighborhood in Aleppo. Um, and um, he had played for me some recordings where he had got an opportunity to play with an electro Balama, but he wasn't using it consistently. But I think he went to Belgium and he had at one point and stayed there for a little while. Um, and he played me some recordings of himself playing. And I thought, oh, I thought this is exactly the kind of thing that I imagine must exist. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend any you know wedding performances or anything by him because the day after I arrived, Hafiz al-Assad passed away and then the whole country was sort of in an official mourning period so he privately you know played for me in his house but he didn't um didn't uh, wasn't doing any engagements um anyway so when in two, 2002 was the first time i actually visited diyarbakir or ahmed in southeastern turkey and you know i was very much looking I was looking for, you know, all Kurdish music that, you know, to just, you know, just to find music that I, you know, and, you know, this being the period before there was YouTube, one couldn't just, you know, surf, uh, you know, and you have like a, access to an infinite archive of recorded um, performances. So it really was, you know, these trips to different places were the only way I could actually experience these sort of local music context. So, um, so when I was there, I heard uh, a wedding. I came across a wedding that was in the Jezaivi neighborhood of uh, Diyarbakir, and it was, uh, you know, it was really struck me. I recorded a little bit on my with my DAT recorder, and it was um, just very feedback driven, you know, uh, interpretations of these um, uh, Kurdish popular songs and folk songs that people would dance to at a wedding. And at that point, I said, oh, this is not only have I found this thing that I was really hoping would exist, but I also really would like to explore this. And so I um, returned in 2004 um, with the idea of making a film about the Kurdish use of the Electro Balama or about the Electro Balama more broadly. Um, I wasn't 100% sure. And um, so then I shot a bunch of material then, but I also, that trip was shortly after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, which um, for all its um, 
the destruction it wrought and the and the chaos that um has ensued in the and you know it enabled me to visit northern uh, iraq or specifically iraqi kurdistan in uh, a way that i wasn't it didn't wasn't didn't didn't seem possible to me um when i was in iran in 1999 actually there was a i was visiting some people in Sanandaj who were actually going to a conference in Arbil and they invited us, me and uh, a friend to come. But then it turned out that the people who would have to be our handlers in the sort of trans-border routes would, uh, were not at all supportive of that idea because of the risks. And you know, anyway, the point being, um, I went to uh, Iraqi Kurdistan and then I, that sort of derailed my focus on strictly on Electro Balma because there were you know, various things that I found there that were not related to that, that were really interesting to me, like Qadri, Zekrin, um, you know, different types mm -hmm. of popular mm -hmm. music and so forth. So anyway, after that, I had a, a certain amount of material. I interviewed Bismili Zeko and um, Bismili Sadat and Amina Arbani and went to the, this, particularly this wedding that Amina Arbani played at. But it was after that that I, especially with the advent of social media, YouTube, and and things like that, that I was able to sort of monitor this evolution of this Grani phenomenon. So I had no real concept that there was this genre specifically called Grani because that was really something that was introduced in the early 2000s by Bismili Zeko and Bismili Sadat. Um, and, I mean, there there have been dances known as Grani that have existed in different regions, but it, as far as I understand, it wasn't even a very widely known dance in that specific region it was something in, in, in there's a garani dance in like hauraman region for instance but um but this became a a kind of innovation by means of which instead of having all these sort of fast-paced dances that just went on and on and on they were able to have this slower paced dance that became more of a showcase for uh instrumental in kind of the agency of, of instrumentalists who wanted to explore different ideas, different textures, different sounds, you know, who are in some ways influenced by, you know, what might be thought of as arabesque or various other kinds of popular music in Turkey and increasingly also like rock music and other things. So I, I saw that there was a younger generation, younger than uh, Bismi Zeko and Bismi Sadat, who were really taking it upon themselves to sort of fashion um, this sound and explore the possibilities of um, the electrobalum in particular, but also the you know keyboards, the clavia, as they say, the you know like corgs and you know various um, uh, synthesizers that um, you know you, you know it was sort of like a, uh, it was a whole project to sort of to combine a studied presentation of. Kurdish music that has a kind of community basis that means a lot to people to, and to communities with a kind of exploring the possibilities of sculpting sound and combining repertoires and, and so forth. Mm. Why make a film though? What was your desire and your intention um, concerning making a film? I mean, you, one can encounter this music, it can spark off all sorts of thought processes and, and kind of pleasurable engagements with the, with the music and with the culture. But the decision to make a film about something is a rather, it's a rather particular thing, isn't it? Tell, tell us what you wanted to achieve by making a film about this rather than doing the, the kinds of things that many other ethnomusicologists would would do perhaps sooner than make a film, which is, um, I don't know, um, be making archival recordings or writing a scholarly monograph or what have you. Yeah, I mean, when I was in college, I studied film and I was into filmmaking, although when I was in college, I actually was, you know, was concentrating on sort of avant-garde idioms. In fact, the, my film department where I was studying frowned upon any form people producing any kind of film work that wasn't very avant-garde like they didn't like narrative work or straight mm. documentary work um but which suited me i mean actually uh that's what i w was interested in but um so even when i in the first few years after college i sort of very stubbornly refused to work with anything other than a bolex which had no sound because i couldn't afford a sound camera but um so i would sort of separate the recording of audio with things i would you know images that i would capture on 16 millimeter just for more of a you know artistic purpose i suppose but at a certain point i thought i realized how absurd that was that why would i not want to actually film with synchronous sound if i'm so drawn to music and musical environments and i also listened so much to music and i always felt like so much was missing 
uh, when you only listen to the recordings. I mean, I, the recordings themselves, you know, if you listen to certain recordings, it's, it's such a um, immersive and amazing experience. I have no complaints when I think of my favorite recordings to listen to, but, um, but there is something, you know, uh, you know, when it comes to situating music in a, a place in within a sort of cultural setting within a certain moment, you know, that you, having uh, a, a sense of the environment and sense of what, you know, what are people doing, especially when people are list, are playing music for the purpose of engaging people in dancing to listen to that without having any sense of the kinetic and visual and social dimension of the dance of dance sort of driven event. I'm not saying there's anything uh, wrong with listening to that, but it's, you know, obviously that the possibilities, um, you know, are greatly enlarged when one, um, you know, attends to these other things and also just getting people to talk, you know, uh, about their perspective on, you know, the, their practices, you know, in some cases that can be, you know, somewhat awkward, but especially when you have a practice that seems to be evolving in real time, it's really good to get a sense of how people, you know, interpret their own role in that or what their, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, their agenda is. And, um, you know, and I also was always very fond of a lot of, uh, you know, films like, you know, Gimme Shelter and, you know, the film of Woodstock and D.A. Pennebaker's film about um, David Bowie's like last performances and on the Ziggy Stardust tour and all this, you know, these, you know, that sort of films that capture the power of a performance and the excitement that it stimulates in an audience and how it's sort of situated in a particular moment. Um, you know, are really, really inspirational for me. And I always liked the idea of bridging uh, representations of popular culture, youth culture, counterculture in, you know, these American and um, English and other uh, milieus with things that have the same energy, but in different, you know, locations in the world. I mean, if you could think of that, um, well, anyway, yeah. So, but uh, the the um, the energy is there. The energy is is very palpable. And um, also, uh, what you were saying about uh, the need to um, include the the dance and the dancers into the narrative. I mean, I think that's very that's very palpable uh, too. Um, but you, you, so you've given us a sort of experimental genealogy of the film. But uh, um, I was th thinking it it makes for. Um, an interesting and an unusual kind of film in terms of the kinds of films that ethnomusicologists usually make or sort of the, the classic ethnomusicological films. Was that a point of reference for you or do, was it more a case of trying to get away from all of that and do something a little bit, a little bit different? Well, I mean, I, mean, I think- to what, first... to what extent is this an, an, an ethnomusicological or an ethnographic uh, film as opposed to a film, another kind of film uh, about Grani. Well, I think when I started, I mean, I only started, uh, you know, as a graduate student in ethnomusicology in 2010. And that, and it took some years for me to think, you know, I always, you know, followed as best I could a lot of uh, scholarship and it took a look by interest in the sort of ethnomusicology. But I also, for a while, I was a little bit ambivalent about actually committing to sort of an academic career or academic pursuits mm -hmm. um, just because of my perception of sort of institutions and academia or whatever. But I, you know, I, I, but ultimately I've decided that it was very uh, worthwhile and be very engaging for me. Um, but I started actually, you know, doing this kind of filming long before that. So like not only this, this project, but also, you know, uh, I went to Afghanistan and Tajikistan and to, Indonesia and like you know, have all these different projects that were focused on sort of parallel and in many ways complementary spheres of, of music making that are sort of explorations of various um, milieus. And I think so I sort of had was cultivating this ethos uh, in terms of how I was going to you know edit these films together and I went through different phases. I mean, in, in 2004 2005 I edited a feature length uh, work. On, based on all the material that I'd shot in both South, uh, you know, uh, North Kurdistan and, and South Kurdistan. Um, and I took a very sort of freewheeling, intuitive approach. Um, and it was, you know, very pastiche like. And I liked it, but I think a lot of, you know, it, only certain of my, you know, friends or people who saw it approved of that or thought that was a, an effective way of, of, um, creating a film. But in this case, I think I try to compromise um, by having a, you know, a certain amount of, you know, 
cinematographically oriented sort of maybe, you know, building on the sort of rockumentary ethos, you know, these sort of rock concert films, like, you know, trying to capture this, you know, have the same sort of um, uh, prioritization of capturing these moments, experiences, levels of energy, but also, you know, trying to have an agenda of um, basically annotating all of that with um, information and especially the perspectives of the actual participants and trying to minimize my own editorial input. I only, only when I feel like I had, you know, um, accumulated information about the genres that I didn't think as being clearly expressed, but I felt confident in, but, I, but it wasn't being cl clearly expressed in the interviews with my, um, the film subjects that I would, I put little, you know, when I wanted something to be very clear to the viewer, I put little intertitles just to say, this is what this is. But for mm -hmm. the most part, I just wanted to really rely on what they had to say about the music. It, it, it struck me that there's, there's a, there's a kind of kinship between the film or the way that you made the film um, and its subject, the, the electroses or the electrobalema, um, which is to say that the filmmaking is, you know, it's about, um, as much as it's about filmmaking, it's also about the modern communications technologies. It's about kind of managing under the rather difficult circumstances that you that you were describing um, earlier on. Um, the, 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 the film is, is, is somehow about kind of managing to make a film under these, uh, really rather difficult and complicated circumstances. The Electro says, uh, has some of those qualities, doesn't it? It has some of those characteristics, which is it's a, it, the instrument is, a, is an, it, the story of the instrument is a story of kind of bricolage, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of applying odd bits of technology to kind of found objects and then making that work in a given kind of musical environment. Um, the instrument itself, again, as you point out, I think very interestingly in the film, lives a very interesting sort of cross-border life, doesn't it? I mean, the, the technology, the patches kind of cross over from Syria and are crossing the borders in various different directions. Stylistically speaking as well, it's the, the, the instrument is, is absorbing things from left, right and centre. So it did strike me that there's an interesting kind of kinship between, you know, the, the style of the film, uh, if you will, and, and the style of the music. Let's talk a little bit about the about the instrument, about the electro says, because I suspect many people, for many people watching the film, um, this is going to be uh, interesting um, for people who know Anatolia and um, that whole geography. This is a it's a very widespread instrument, isn't it? It's it's uh, it, it has a long history, which you uh, uh, described earlier. Um, in its uh, electrified form, it goes back to the 1970s. Uh, Orhan Genja by Erkin Koray uh, supposedly uh, invented it. In the 1970s, it was already becoming, um, you know, a sort of standard kind of wedding instrument, wasn't it? Tell us a little bit more um, about about the instrument, about how you are hearing it, about what what story you feel the instrument it, itself is telling. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, um, Orhan, Orhan Genjibai, for instance, who you just mentioned, and I know you've, I mean, you've written a, a book on arabesque as well as even your other book uh, that sort of look at sort of social perspectives uh, on popular music in Turkey. And, um, you know, so he, I interviewed him rather extensively for the film, and I only included a very small amount of the film because I wanted to focus on the Kurdish musicians and their perspectives. But um, I just wanted him to, you know, speak a little bit about the development of the um, electrobalama and his role in it or his perception of how it came into being. And if I had I included the longer, uh, you know, bits of the inter interview, he explained kind of like step by step how there was this desire to amplify this instrument at the time when all instruments were being, you know, uh, amplified, essentially, and sort of going through different um experimental 
trial and error processes trying to figure out what would be a suitable way of of having some kind of microphone and there were different kinds of microphones but they had their drawbacks and mm. and there was also this sort of ambition that he had to have uh he and others they wanted you know technicians to develop uh, a kind of amplification that was unique to the instrument that actually would create like a whole new you know sound he was even talking and i don't know to what extent this should be taken with a grade of sand, but he was talking about like, you know, trying to have, find new alloys for new kinds of strings and things like that. But, you know, basically the idea was that there could be some kind of intervention into the actual material technology of the instrument, not just uh, just to, you know, achieve amplification, but to, you know, redesign its uh, sonic properties. Um, but anyway, they ended up putting guitar pickups on it that became like the very simple solution is to put pickups that are essentially the same as guitar pickups um and have a sort of a holly bo hollow bodied or a very heavy almost solid body um uh version of it and then today um many musicians who like to play electrified uh balama repertoire like like another version which is basically an acoustic balama with a, what they call a fishman pickup or you know that's the name of the and that's sort of has its own possibilities where it can draw on the acoustic properties but also the electric properties like you can be an acoustic sound but with some electric uh, electronic signal processing um so you know there's a whole realm of um you know applications of the electrobalama especially in turkey i mean we could talk about outside of turkey we could think about you know macedonia and or North Macedonia, you know, a genre like um, um, Tavala that um, is, and things like that, where there are there are plenty of other genres or locations where the instrument is used. But especially in Turkey, there are like sort of like you just mentioned the idea of like sort of crossing borders. And what's interesting is that if you look at the political boundary between, say, southern Turkey and southeast Turkey, and um, south uh, northeast Syria and nor um, Iraqi Kurdistan, a lot of the 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 continuity of music and culture and language is you know has is not in any way interrupted by those political boundaries. But there mm. are more I'd say more firm geographic boundaries separating different parts of Turkey or mm. different spheres. Like you know Ankara mm. is has a particular sound that's associated with the electrobalama, and so um, so that when it sort of had there's a sort of continuity of the the pavian aesthetic of um which i try to give a little bit of a sense of in the film that yeah. this is you know one particular environment where the particular sound has been honed a very sparse you might say almost like funky groovy um and almost invariably phase shifted clean electrobalama tone it's very you know very defining for the sort of sound of, of uh, music that is based on anatolian sort of folk music from like places like kirshahir and that region whereas um istanbul i guess you know it's sort of uh epicenter of arabesque and other you know popular musics and the sort of the turkey's recording industry but those i mean as you as i you know initially learned from you the, there were these associations with um arabesque as with with people f flocking to places like istanbul as you know as economic migrants especially and you know, all these sort of class connotations in terms of what their taste in music was and you know what people would bring with them as singers and musicians as if they came from antep or um or, uh, uh, so there's like, and I think that's a dimension that's also very present in, you know, the, and I didn't emphasize it to a great degree in the film, but it's something that I would tend to emphasize and discuss more in writing would be um, the extent to which there are sort of conflicting attitudes um, in terms of this aesthetic, the, that where the Grani aesthetic of mm -hmm. that uses the electrobalama in terms of as a representation of you know, Kurdish music, Kurdish culture, and so forth. Um, but I think that the electrobalama in general got really swept up into that, that people would, um, you know, publicly apologize for having used it. I think didn't Arif Saad do that, you know, because people, it was sort of considered to be a corrupting force, you know, representing the unrefined classes or, you know, the cheapening of, uh, you know, Turkey's Anatolian folk music uh, mm -hmm. heritage 
and it, it became a music that you know basically i think the instrument you know it was used by sort of rock psychedelia oriented musicians like you know eric and Corey and Mogalar and so forth and 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 then the disco folk of um of um Derdy Oklar, um who are based i think in stuttgart if i'm not mistaken so there were certain corners where it really was given a a fairly broad space but within turkey i feel like it was mainly a kind of a decorative um garnish that was put in woven into a lot of arabesque recordings or music so-called arabesque recordings and then it was it's you know a, a mainstay in turku bars and pavillons that have very pronounced social connotations that not everyone feels comfortable going you know places where they have their conservatrice like these hostesses that come and you know they're sort of like this whole you know uh kind of seedy dimension to a lot of these places and i feel like it kind of became locked into that uh those contexts and then was used in wedding contexts but you know certainly wedding contexts where the music that was predominant at those contexts would be thought of as folk music so it's quite interesting to me that invariably all the musicians that are in um that i feature in the film are very quick to define the if they you know the grani is a specific dance, but also it can be used very broadly to the sound aesthetic and to this genre with the very overdriven electrobalama and so forth. But the other way that they sort of define or encapsulate what sort of the repertoire that they play is, it's just folk music or folklore, Kurdish folklore is the way they say it. So, I mean, this is an interesting thing is that it, it's, it's sort of, it's, the electrobalama, you know, has had resurgences. Like I think there's a, um, Kalan, I think, is going to put out or eminently putting out a um, compilation of electrobalama, Turkish electrobalama music, and um, so and they're like they're kitschy, you know, sort of like there there are, is a resurgence of interest, I think, in um, you know arabesque and and Ankara sound that is a little bit more retro flex. What do you call it? Like you know, you know, it's part of the sort of um, um, flex. Infatuation with vintage aesthetics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the things that uh, struck me in, in in the film, one of the things that it seems that you are trying to, you're wanting to point out to us, uh, which struck me as being interesting as regards the instrument. Well, one thing is that the the electro version of the instrument is just completely different from the acoustic version of the instrument. If you try and play the the electro in the same way that you play the acoustic version of the instrument, it's an absolute, you just can't do it. So with, um, with amplification, it becomes quite its own musical instrument, doesn't it? Um, and one of the things that, uh, that, that I think that you, you point to in the film is uh, a kind of, how can I put it, a sort of translational sort of property. Um, you, you, you can make it sound like other instruments, you can, uh, the, the the electro can um, can pick up and um, and not so much imitate as translate I suppose you could say the sounds of a lot of other wedding instruments like the zurna uh, for mm -hmm. example which is the aerophone instrument the advantage of of um, of, of using the um, here we go of of uh, of the electro is that uh, is that even though the zurna is ear splittingly is absolutely deafeningly loud and unamplified uh, with the electro of course you've got a lot more you've got a lot more um, kick to it there's also the kemenche isn't there which is an instrument that is not much certainly in turkey is not much known or not much thought of as a kurdish instrument it's much more associated with the northeast um, of the country so yeah i mean there was something that seems to be there in the film is is how the instrument um has these sort of translational properties it can do it can do just do so many different things you know you've got a whole um a whole repertoire of instrumental sounds and instrumental practices that it can allude to that's yes, exactly. And, and and I think that, you know, there there are always sort of possibilities that can be explored or are being explored. But fundamentally, I think that the, you know, four points of reference for the Electrobalama repertoire of this context are the um, uh, the Zurna, as used for wedding, the company wedding dances, the Kamancha, as you said, that, that is very specifically used in, for Kurdish music 
in the region that encompasses sort of Mardin, Nusaibin, Midiat, and Kamishlo, especially Nusaibin, uh, Midiat, and Kamishlo is, 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 is where um, there's a dance called Jida, and it's played by these um, musicians, most of whom are of Dom uh, background, which has been until recently was probably the case for most wedding musicians in general. Um, um, but in nowadays, Kurdish people who are, you know, identify very strictly as Kurdish are much more prominent, especially when they play electrobolomas and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's like the electric guitar as used in rock music and hard rock and so forth. And then there's, and then there is like, you know, aspects of balama, acoustic balama playing that, you know, everyone who, every electrobolama player has a background or grounding in playing acoustic balama as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely those, but those four components are very present and, and, um, uh, you know, and they each, you know, bring a specific um you know approach to the rhythmic uh propulsion of, of how the instrument is played whether the sustain is used i mean the zorna obviously an electrified and overdriven balma is able to have the sustain which most acoustic string instruments don't have um that the zorna has that is um you know uh, the term often used as kabasas for you know in turkey for music that has that kind of outdoor loud quality to be heard over a large crowd and so forth another thing uh, that, that you, you, your film uh, picks up on is uh, the people playing the instrument uh, can hear the sounds of 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 um of voices um and of songs and particularly the kalam of the the, the uh, versification of the of the dengbej this comes up quite often it'd be interesting um i think if you were to say a few words about who the dengbej are and and how this is being heard um in in the sound of the electrosas and, and 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 sort of what it means i think to be hearing these i you know deeply authenticating kurdish sounds in this let's just say deeply <laughs> non-authentic, if not inauthentic, uh, instrument. Uh, Aram Dikram also comes up, doesn't he? Very, very interesting and important, almost a sort of central figure in those borderlands who just embodies all of these movements across borders, um, you know, the, the, the life of this sort of multiple refugee, I suppose you could describe him, whose who's music, uh, an Armenian, right? Who, who mm -hmm. happened to I mean, Sing and, and compose in Kurdish, and I think he died in in, in Greece, uh, didn't he? And his last wish uh, was to be buried in Ahmed in Diyarbakir, uh, but that wasn't to happen um, in the event. It, it interested me that that his name came up, and and that somewhere in the the texture of the electro is is, is the song repertory of of Aram uh, Dikram. What, what is what is this telling us about Kurdish musical culture? I mean, it seems it, to me it adds something very interesting and very rich to our, um, you know, for, for those of us who are not part of this musical culture ourselves, admittedly impoverished knowledge of and understanding of Kurdish music. But um, it's 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 your your film offers, I think, um, an interesting perspective on Kurdish musical culture. So I just wanted to put that to you as a kind of closing question here. Yeah, thank you. And so, so like, I think there's two things we can sort of think about, and, and they're very nicely represented both by thinking about like the Dengbej and also thinking about um, uh, Aram Tikran, and which are on one hand, if you look at the region that is conceptualized as Kurdistan, I mean, it also overlaps with greater Armenia, it overlaps with Tor Abedin, and like overlaps with lots of different uh, you know, identities and, and regions. Um, and of course, we have like these sort of nonsensical political boundaries. And I say nonsensical, but really they're like, they can be very destructive in the, what they exert on people, how they've affected people over the, you know, 20th century. Um, but there's sort of like, when we think about strictly speaking, a Kurdish identity, it's very, it's varied. It varies from region to region. And it's also varies between, you know, rural environments, village environments, mountain environments, plains environments, urban environments, and so forth. 
Um, but the cities in general, like Kamishlo, like Ahmed or Diyarbakir, like, you know, um, Hewler, Arbil, are, you know, for centuries and centuries and centuries, they've always been very cosmopolitan in their in their populations. And so they have, there's urban culture, urban music that is inherently cosmopolitan. And I think Aram Dikran is very emblematic of that, have someone who is, you know, associated both with um, Diyarbakir and with Kamishlo. Um, and the the musical and sort of urban musical culture in both places, and so he very naturally finds his way into um, you know people's uh, repertoires. And but it may be slightly arbitrary the fact that it was a version of his song. It was you know like a long sort of medley of various songs, but it, in name uh, it was a version of his song to as Kalkiran Jawani that became the most the, the really broke this aesthetic intervention to you know people who are music consumers you know and as recorded on a cassette uh, Miss Millie's Echo's second album that was released by the Ashanlar label and then with the, as far as the Dengbej I mean like Dengbej is a kind of a, a role as an art um that um it's also I mean it it it's both I think rural and urban it but it's very much Kurdish um, and for many people, it has a strong association with the sort of feudal hierarchies where you have these agas, these land land um, owners who then, you know, would have, um, you know, the bards who are affixed to them and would, you know, sing these narratives that basically would be telling of that region where, it was, you know, it's sort of that... It's, it's it's so I mean the there's a you know very precise geography to Dengbej's and their um, tradition and their repertoire, but also there's a lot of the content tells of very specific events, often very traumatic events, and so the inclusion of sort of allusions to um, the the singing style or the recit recitational style of the Dengbej and also to the content, especially emphasizing the sort of um, narration of crisis and catastrophe that has befallen Kurdish people is something that is very frequently woven into wedding performances because as much as wedding performances are supposed to be festive and celebratory they often are a space for people to acknowledge the intensity of their current and recent sort of historical experience um i mean in the film they they're they're it is remarked several times that there's this idea that the dengbej re represent the sort of you know eternal indigenous kurdish way of singing which then got increasingly set to music. I don't know if I would necessarily assume that that is exactly chronologically correct, but I think that becomes this sort of symbolic idea that you have uh, a sort of uh, an, a, a, an, a, an idiom, a kind of discursive mode that's aestheticized, that has this, you know, that is a vessel of meaning and sort of historical reflection for Kurds that then you know, the content of that becomes merged or informs dance music and then contemporary music that has this sort of, you know, it's a it's a, a affirmation of the rootedness of both the dances and of the sentiment that the, and the sort of uh, tonal, timbral, musical, melodic, you know, characteristics of the uh, Dengbej idiom that are, you know, inherited by the musicians who are playing today and who are you know using electric instruments and of course you know there's a certain people in certain cases would you know be quick to dismiss this music as being too aggressive or too you know um designed to appeal to young especially young men i would say you know who have a you know that has this, this energy it has this sort of hard rock you know sort of character to it so not everyone completely um is quick to embrace or to you know um advocate for attention being given this style of music but if you as you see in the film it's something that serves and really animates communities of all ages and even you know a consciousness of the you know the age range of participants was very much part of the you know initial intervention on the part of Bismillah Sadat to to look for some slower you know paced dance so to make sure that older people could be you know um engaged in, in at weddings where there was you know there's this increasingly you know was like this athleticized fast-paced dancing which was getting more and more dominant mm -hmm. george this has been a a fascinating conversation i've learned a tremendous amount from it and i'm sure norian's uh, viewers will as well uh, 
I enjoyed the film uh, tremendously. Uh, and um, I know, again, that Norian's um, viewers are going to enjoy it uh, very much as well. Um, thanks for this chat. Uh, I've enjoyed it a lot. And I'll um, hand back to our moderator. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great to see you.